Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Stefan Kraber, Christian Brana. We both work for Canonical on the BlackSD team. Uh, so we do uh, container development in both user space and kernel space. Um, and today we're going to be looking at containers and how you can kind of build them, what are all the components that you need, and how everything fits together. So first thing, what are containers? That's always a bit of a funny topic, because there's, it's kind of weird on Linux, frankly. Um, normal concepts that containers are effectively isolated systems. They behave kind of like virtual machines, but they share a kernel of the host. That's kind of the general concept of containers. Where it gets weird is that there is no such thing as a container in the Linux kernel. Um, you can go and look as much as you want. Maybe someone would have mentioned container somewhere in a comment in there. But there is no container struct. There's no container um, anything really in the, in the kernel. You instead have a lot of different components that user space will randomly pick and put together and hope that they end up with something that's a container. Um, you really can't get a single handle on something that is like a container. Not even, yeah. at least uh, not right now. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be some yeah. kind of audit <laughs> ID thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's been a bit of a recurring topic. There's been some people who want to be like, I, I've got this process. What container does it belong to? Huh? <laughs> Like, there's, there's really no such thing. Um, so people have been coming up with their own solution. Um, the audit people have been pushing pretty hard for a while to try and get such an identifier. And it's going to be a audit-specific identifier. And that's kind of the way that's, that's going to end up being. Um, looking at some of the common components for containers, um, we've got them in three different chunks. So the first thing is mostly for isolation. So the most obvious thing is you want to have your own um, file system, like be it another distro or some container image or something. Um, you just do that with either true root or pivot root. We'll go into more details for all of those afterwards. Um, then you use namespaces um, to let you have your own host name, your own, your own mount entries, your own view of processes, um, your own network stack, IPC, um, uh, view of the C group, hierarchy, uh, and even user. User is a bit weird because it is technically part of isolation, but it is also um, part of security. Um, it is effectively the main security uh, feature that we're using for containers these days um, uh, for those not doing previous containers. Anyone who attended our talk back in uh, San Diego probably remembers what we think of privileged containers. Um, don't use those. <laughs> Now, at the security layer, uh, there are a few things we can do. Um, one of the things that we often use, even if only as a safety net for unprivileged containers, are LSMs. So that's Obama, SLNX, Mac, well, your own. Um, we use SecComp to block a number of pretty dangerous syscalls, uh, especially those that have been linked to security issues. And you can use capabilities to drop a set of capabilities for the container, or even just only retain a very specific set of capabilities to even further isolate your container. And then you've got resource control, which is, again, kind of separate from all of those. Uh, so that's what C groups do. And it's mostly about avoiding denial of service type attacks, but it's still pretty useful. Um, and, and basically, all of these comp components are optional um, because of the it's a user space fiction container, so you, you sort of you can choose what you want to use uh, to define your uh, container. But since we so we have a particular focus, right? When we talk about containers, we usually treat it as a like you would any standard Linux system. When we mean containers, we mean you boot an init system and a normal Linux distribution comes up. So f for us, the container is you combine all of these features essentially. All right. Yeah. In the case of Lexi, what we use is literally all of those. Uh, so in this tutorial, we're going to be going one by one through those and show you some examples of how they work and um, also some of the issues they might have uh, to give you an idea on how you can effectively assemble your own containers. Um, but first, this. Um, so th yeah, there are a few things we need to kind of say. Uh, so yeah, in general, you don't want to rely on privileged containers. Um, we talked at length about that back in San Diego. Um, you also do not 
um, you shouldn't assume that you can like look at the code of an existing container manager and just optimize it because it looks like they're doing something that's slow, like doing you know main, um, setting up namespaces in two chunks instead of doing one big chunk. There are reasons why sometimes you need to do such weird things, um, and if you don't, you might end up with a few CVEs on your project uh, that you don't really expect. If it's complicated, there is usually a CVE for it. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of interactions among a lot of the components we're going to be showing that are also kind of tricky. Um, that can include interactions between yeah, namespacing orders, um, seccomp policy, uh, and some ways of bypassing them, especially when you would combine things with ptrace, which makes things always so much more fun. Um, ProcFS, CSFS, all the permissions on those file systems and how those get set up, again, depending on what order you've put everything together. Um, most of the existing kernel runtimes, I've learned that the hard way. Um, like some of the stuff we, we know because we implemented the kernel features, but some of the others we know because we had to deal with a critical CVE we had to fix in a rush because, oops. Um, so you probably don't, we don't want to be like that, and it's much easier to use something that already exists. That being said. Um, Right. So uh, one of the, I think this was one of the first bits we talked about um, is file system isolation. Um, usually, again, this is probably specific to, uh, again, if you uh, think about a container being a fully separate system, then you usually also want to have a, a separate root file system, right? The same way you have it for a VM, you have a VM image, image and when you want to start a container, you know, you want it to have its own view on the file system hierarchy. And uh, there are different, well, the grandfather of all this, or the, the ancestor is Crude, right? Or Shroot, whatever you're, you fancy, um, which uh, lets you change into, well, basically lets you switch your view on the file system hierarchy, such that you have the illusion that, for example, if you Shroot into a certain directory, this now becomes your root uh, file system, your slash, essentially. Uh, but that's horribly unsafe, and I think um, Stefan is going to demo it in a little bit, um, because you can easily break out of it. Uh, and the advanced variant is uh, pivot root, uh, which most container runtimes use, um, but it has uses outside of that system. It is using it, for example, to set up the uh, initial file system when the system is booted, uh, and it prevents a bunch of the escapes that are trivially doable with, um, with root. And um, it requires, though it requires that uh, you are in a new mount namespace um, to do it correctly, otherwise you're going to mess with your system, which Truth doesn't require you to have a new mount namespace. Um, yeah, and gets your private file system hierarchy, that's what, it, you get your own view on Slash. That's basically what it is, and you should go on and demo it. Yeah, there's one restriction for those who want to use uh, Pivot Root if you are trying to use it on top of a RAM disk, like in, inside an ETRD, that's not going to work. Uh, you, your target, um, your new root cannot be um, on the RAM disk. You also cannot do it if, uh, um, if you're on MS Shared. Yeah, there's that too, yeah, because the implication of things then vanishing underneath you are problematic. So, um, to show this one, uh, what I'll be doing is, as an privileged user, I'm just gonna, and we're gonna go into more details about that in a sec, but for now I'm just gonna create a new user namespace with a new mount namespace, with a new pid namespace. I'm gonna remap root, uh, my user to root, and fork. Okay, so now I'm root, even, I'm really not, it's just inside the user namespace. Um, We've got a directory here that's um, a Alpine Linux uh, root file system. So I can do the normal true root spawn bin sh. Okay, that worked fine. Okay, the permissions are a bit off, but that's because I did the user namespace. That seems fine. Okay, now uh, let's mount proc. Okay, that worked. Okay, I don't like my true root anymore. Let's get out. And you're back on the host. So that's true for you. Um, let's try that again. But this time, let's use exact same unshare. This time, I need to create a uh, mountain tree for my true. So you just bind mount it on top of itself. All it does is add a blank mountain tree at the end. It's a kernel enforced restriction for pivot root. Right. 
then you CD into it, then you pivot through it onto itself. Um, then we exec binsh. Okay. And say I want to do that. Oh, look at that. That doesn't work anymore. Uh, also, because I did a typo. Hold on. <laughs> okay. So that will work, but instead of getting back on the host, I just got back into myself. So the, um, the root in this case is actually pointing at the, the root post pivot root and doesn't let you see um, on the, to the outside. Oh, and if you have any questions, like if we, for example, use the unshare tool and you don't know what any of these options do or mean, you should ask questions. Well, we'll questions go through right those away. in the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> but you should ask questions right away. I mean, yeah. It's so that's file system isolation. Uh, yeah, let's switch that one too. Yeah, sweet. Cool. Right. Um, namespaces. I mean, who hasn't heard of namespaces? Fi finally, I was excited. That's not true. I know that. <laughs> uh, you just wish you didn't. <laughs> yeah. That's. I think. But I think this is really the first time where I where I asked it, and uh, there was a no hand up. So great. Um, so namespaces are, um, um, I like to quote Eric, who is one of the main authors of a bunch of namespaces, who said that uh, namespaces are a way to get around uh, design mistakes or inflexibilities of Linux. Um, and they shouldn't exist, which he said. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they are one of the main concepts of, uh, that, you, that we use to build containers. Um, and most of them are in some way concerned with Restricting certain views, access, or information that you uh, from yeah from you. So, for example, UTS namespace, which I think was the first namespace that was ever done. Um, it lets you change the host name, which is obviously kind of useful, especially if you think about booting a system container. You probably want to set up your own host name and so on. So you can have a different host name in a UTS namespace than you can have on your host. Um, Sorry? No. Oh, I thought it was a question, sorry. Um, and, uh, but, but we have a bunch more. We have seven so far, and I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, I can still count. Um, but there is an uh, eighth one coming up uh, from, again, from the Creo corner of the world, um, the time namespace. Uh, UTS namespace, obviously, what I said, isolates the host name. The mount namespace uh, isolates, isolates your view or restricts your view on um, the file systems that are mounted on your system and also allows you, with some exceptions, um, to give you a private mount table, which means that, for example, if you mount a file system, let's say TempFS, because that's possible, if you mount TempFS in a new amount namespace, this mount will show up in your amount namespace, but you will not see it outside of that mount namespace if you haven't set up a shared mount point, because mount namespaces are horribly complex because of the fact there is something like a shared mount point. Who knows what a shared mount point is? OK, so for all of those who don't of know. Of those, only one of you like, actually enjoys knowing about those. <laughs> oh. oh, you think it's useful, right? <laughs> right. They okay. can be useful. Uh, they're also a headache. Yes. So it's like when you think about um, when I th you think about namespaces of isolating two or giving you two distinct views, right? You usually don't expect that there is an easy way to punch a hole in both of them. But that's exactly what shared mount points do. If you have marked the mount point as shared and you unshare a new mount namespace and then you mount something on top of that shared mount point or underneath that shared mount point, then it will be visible in both namespaces suddenly. So obviously what you need to make sure if you set up a container that if you don't want to leak information from outside into the container or from inside of the container to the host, that all of these shared mount points have been remounted such that they are marked as private, uh, such that these two namespaces cannot affect, uh, affect each other. That's actually yeah, um, so they're horribly complex. Um, the user namespace is one of the most essential namespaces because it's the only one uh, that is really concerned with isolating the privilege concept on, um, 
on Linux. So, for example, if I unshare a username, if I unshare a UTS namespace or a mount namespace, nothing changes with what I can actually do to the system. I might not have access to certain aspects of the system, such as I cannot get to certain mount points of file systems, but in general, it, it doesn't stop me from calling sudo reboot and then I'm rebooting the whole system, for example. Or because I'm, I'm still, if I'm root, I'm still real root. Um, if uh, I have a capability, I have that capability f for the whole system. And the user namespace isolates both UIDs and GIDs, so the most basic privilege concept on Linux, uh, and capabilities. So suddenly if you unshare a new user namespace and you write an ID mapping, then um, your ID inside of uh, that user namespace and outside of that user namespace have different meanings. So let's say I'm on the host UID 1000. Now I create a user namespace and I set up a mapping uh, that maps my UID 1000 to something completely unpriv unprivileged on the host. Let's say 1,200. That's my new 1, uh, 2. That's my new uh, UID on that UID 1000 gets mapped to, which means I don't have any privileges at all anymore. And, but from inside of the container, I can, still, I can still make it such that I appear to be root. So if I do inside of the container IDU, I will see zero, whereas on the host, my process is actually running with a completely unprivileged UID. Such that when I break out of that container and am now uh, on the host, nothing will happen. Or I can, I, can do something, I can do nothing at all, essentially. The same way capabilities for user namespaces, the capabilities are now charged against my user namespace and not against the host anymore. Meaning if I, for example, have capsys admin, then I have capsys admin in a user namespace and not capsys admin on the host. Um, so it is, it's vitally important to use user namespaces because they give you a really massive amount of security. Um, and there are more network namespaces. You isolate your uh, view on, um, on network devices. Uh, IPC namespaces give you private uh, inter-process communication um, and cgroup namespaces uh, isolate your view on the cgroup file systems. But I think the best way to all illustrate this is uh, if Stefan does it. Yeah, and the other thing we can just mention is um, you can set up those namespaces at process creation time through clone. Um, you can set them up afterwards by unsharing some namespaces, which is mostly what I'll be doing from the shell afterwards. Uh, and you can join you can join them using setNS. So you've got the way of really messing with them and they are they're visible through proc. So you can for any process see what namespace they're in. So if we look at if we look at that, uh, I need to get this one. Cool. Um, so the first thing we can look is at the unshare uh, command, which is covering most of what the, the kernel unshare Cisco lets you do. So it lets you unshare all the namespaces we just went through. It lets you um, fork, which is required for the PID namespace. Because um, when you unshare a PID namespace, you don't want your process's current PIDs to change. That would cause a lot of problems. So only its children are going to be in that PID namespace. So that's why you need to fork. Um, the dash R option I used earlier is literally so that my current user, which is some random number on that machine gets mapped to zero in inside the container so that you root. And the rest is to control some of the month propagation and um, group restrictions. So um, we can look at my current processes namespaces. So you can list proxelf and s and you'll see the inode of each individual namespace in there. Uh, so for now we'll just remember that H37 is the end of the inode of user. Uh, and we can unshare, so you want to share the user namespace, map root, and fork. Uh, and you see that it's now uh, one to three. So the user namespace has changed, the rest hasn't. Now we can unshare a mount namespace, um, which by itself doesn't really get you that much, other than now, even time like, I mean, I've never used to do anything. I'm not real root at all, and I should be able to mount random stuff. Um, oh, only trusted file systems, not everything, obviously, because that'd be terrible for security. Um, that's unshare a network namespace, at which point we can see only have a loopback device in there. And lastly, let's do a PID. 
namespace and fork because it's the bit namespace. And mount proc and look at our process list. And my shell is now bid one in that namespace. Um, let's say I want to change my host name. Well, that's not going to work. It's a bit confused. User space is a bit confused sometimes because it's like you must be root to change the host name. Well, I am. Just not root enough. Um, so let's share a UTS namespace. Then try that again. And then spawn the process. So that's really most of the namespaces at work. Unshare is pretty nice command line tool to play with those, especially because you don't even need uh, privileges to really do any of that. Um, yeah, could, could you do me one favor and start a Lexi container and then show one of the process running as root from the host? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I can, I can do that with just Unshare. Yeah. So if I enter the user namespace, I remap by fork. Um, one thing I can do first is if I just touch random file. So I'm touching blah on in, in slash temp, but now if I get out and I look and I look at who owns it, it's my own user uh, because it's just my own user is mapped to root. Um, same thing. Uh, what's my process ID? Okay, so it's that thing. Let's switch terminal to another one and just drip for that process. And we see it's running as my user. And if you do IDU inside of that unshare? Uh, yeah. Uh, Oh, from inside, sure. Uh, so from inside, it was TMP blah, so it on, it's on by root. And as far as ID is concerned inside the container, you are root, but both, group, both user and group are mapped to my normal and previous user. So this whole mapping concept always, when you theoretically talk about it, it always sounds very complicated, but that's basically it. It pretends that you're root inside of that user namespace, but uh, from the view of the system as a whole, you're just an unprivileged user. Right. One of the uh, um, classic security features of, uh, I guess, of Linux that predate containers probably by a long shot um, is SecComp, and most of you are probably familiar with this as well, I guess. Um, SecComp allows you to restrict what syscalls uh, a given process is allowed to make. So usually for unprivileged containers, so containers using user namespaces, um, the security given to you or guaranteed by the user namespace itself is for the most part sufficient, so you actually would not necessarily need SecComp. Um, but for good measure, we still do it for a couple of uh, for a couple of syscalls, right? Open by handle it, and uh, a bunch of other crazy ones. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was gonna mention our favorite open by. I know that that's the uh, handle that. That one is always great because uh, if you've got a privileged container, it gets you the great property of letting you. I think you need to pass an FD of the path you want, and then you can open a path relative to that. The problem is it lets you cross the pivot root boundary. So say you open slash in your container, and then you ask for a bunch of dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash it's your shadow. <laughs> it's going to get your handle onto the it's shadow of the host so long as the, the file system backing the container is the same file system that's backing the host. So that was pretty bad. Um, there was a CV against Docker for that particular one. So I think pretty much everyone blocks it in their uh, second policy at this point. Force you uh, mount uh, a Anyway, for, any, at least for those that are using privileged containers, for sure. It right. does not apply to unprivileged containers. Um, if you use a user namespace, that attack is just not a thing. Yeah, and you can usually decide for a whitelist or for a blacklist. And there are, um, I mean, you can use very basic SECOM that restricts you, um, that restricts you that doesn't allow you to do a lot of fancy stuff, but then SecComp also has, for example, a filter mode, and then there's a nice user space library that lets you interact with SecComp, and then you can do fine-grained system call filtering. So for example, you cannot just say, the easy thing to say is, I don't want my users to be allowed to do make not calls. For, um, but in general, you may want, you want, maybe you want to be able to, for example, create sockets or pipes, which you can do with the make not syscall, or certain character devices or certain block devices. So you only, you basically want to tell the kernel, 
don't block all make not sys calls, only block make not sys calls that have that have specific arguments. And so seccom filters allow you to do that as long as the argument is not uh is passed in register and is not a pointer. Uh, if it's a pointer, then you cannot filter on it, which means you cannot, for example, uh, say uh, restrict amount this call, um, but only if it starts with this path. That's not possible uh, with uh, SecCom, and for good reasons that we have LSM for that for the most part. Um, but so you can have fine grade filters, for example, for make not. You can make it. You can tell SecCom only uh, block make not sys calls for block devices, but allow character devices and allow pipes and sockets. It's also something that we do. For um, unprivileged containers, we have even expanded uh, SecCom quite a bit. Uh, a good friend of mine has written a patch set. Um, that allows you to intercept syscalls and um, delegate the decision whether or not that syscall is supposed to be successful to user space. Um, so you register a filter, say, intercept make not syscalls for all character devices. Um, and then the kernel traps that syscall. Um, that message can be forwarded to a more privileged user space process, in this case, usually the container manager. The container manager can then inspect the arguments uh, for that syscall and then make a decision and go on and to tell the kernel, it's okay, this syscall is supposed to be successful or this syscall is supposed to fail. Uh, now the crucial step, obviously, is, um, especially for unprivileged containers, that any make not syscall uh, will fail, right? That's uh, because imagine you could create block devices or character devices inside of a container. Then you could, I, I don't know, create some random character device and get access to to all of the host's memory. I, I mean, it's easy to crash the system with this. So make not doesn't work. The kernel will not allow you to make make um, uh, to create device nodes. But often, especially when we boot system containers, or in, I guess in general any container. We usually need a set of devices, uh, dev null, dev full, dev zero, dev random, dev view random, dev console, uh, because user space expects these to be available and for that to work. Um, and what we do usually is we bind mount them in from the host. So we already consider them safe. There is no known attack vector that you can gain uh, through these devices. Um, but we need to bind mount them in because we cannot create uh, devices inside unprivileged containers. So uh, the second notifier lets you get around this. So because you can intercept a syscall and the syscall is blocked, the process making a syscall is blocked. And so you can emulate, as a container manager, who's usually a more privileged process, you can emulate the syscall in user space. So for example, you can go into the file system of the container, create the device node, um, if that is successful, you then tell the kernel, okay, I've succeeded in emulating the syscall. Please report back to the process that the syscall actually succeeded. It's a very powerful, uh, very powerful mechanism that, we've, uh, that, we've, uh, that we're using um, that even lets you expand, uh, that even lets you expand uh, what you can do with unprivileged containers in a safe way, I would say. Okay. Uh, so let's play with second a tiny bit. Uh, okay. All right. Um, what did this one go? Okay. So let's first create, uh, just set up a namespace quickly. So we want user namespace, mount namespace, I uh, want root and fork. Okay. Um, So I can mount stuff right now. Because I've got a mount namespace, I'm root in that user namespace. It owns the mount namespace, and so I can't mount stuff. Now I've got this piece of code here, which is using seccomp. It sets up a um, seccomp filter, which catches uh, the mount syscall and will have it, um, have it blocked and returning e o as the um, as the error, so that ends up being a second binary, and the binary calls a uh, bash at the end. So I can just run it. Now I'm in a subshell that's got that profile applied. Um, let's see. Let's try to mount. And there we go. So it's now being blocked, and it's returning the weird um, error code that Christian came up with. Um, why? Why? Isn't that very common? No. <laughs> 
So sec comp, that's like the most common thing. You would obviously block any of those. Um, like if you're running a previous container, you would be blocking any of those syscalls um, that we mentioned earlier that are not particularly nice. Yeah. So you're running on x86, 64 bucks? Yeah. You know if your kernel supports x32? Yeah. Um, you, then you haven't blocked them out. I know. Yeah, yeah. It's, we, so, I, I right. did, did so we've got for the, this we, demo, I obviously did right. the easy thing and just didn't even go through libsercomp. I just wrote a bit of BPF. But yeah. Um, yeah, so you, you, you there is we have we have users we have users users for example I think Chromebook is a classic example they have a Arch, uh, ARM 64 kernel running an ARM 32-bit uh, user space um, and other crazy stuff. Yeah, then it runs an ARM 64-bit VM. Space, the VM so. Yeah, so I think there's changed like ARM 64-bit host kernel with ARM 32-bit user space that runs an ARM 64-bit VM that runs an ARM 32-bit user space that runs an ARM 64-bit right. container. But that's not um, the interesting so you, case. Is we, do have the, we do have the logic in, in LibLXC to generate uh, right. the policies for uh, uh, both personalities to we avoid to those kind of issues. We have to do this because we sometimes have 64-bit kernel and 32-bit user space, which runs another container runtime, which then loads a 64-bit user space. And then you can have another container runtime running a 32-bit user space. And so you need to load all of the compatible architectures like um, seccom filter so that you really block all syscalls, because otherwise you might end up um, there is other weird stuff, like mm -hmm. a really complicated corner, well, complicated, but there are really corner cases to think about. Um, so, for example, I talked about the second notifier, which is my new uh, favorite toy and uh, example to illustrate how crazy things can get. Um, uh, Jan actually pointed this out, I think, on uh, the mailing list when we implemented this. So the second notifier also lets you uh, continue syscalls. Um, so you can load a second uh, filter, you intercept syscalls, and then you wait for the container manager to make a decision. But by the way second is designed, the latest, the filter that was loaded the latest is always the one that takes precedent. So somebody could load a second notifier filter that get asks for permission to continue a syscall before yours before your second notifier filter triggers, and so you continue a syscall, although you may you may want to block it and so on. So there are really weird, tricky corner cases. So don't write your own container manager. Oh right, um, capabilities. Ha huh, yeah, uh, it's usually the. Technically, this is something I didn't know for a long time. Technically, this is like um, you can consider it an LSM, but it's one that's always enabled, right? Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and uh, capabilities on Linux are a kind of weird, complicated beast. Like, I'm not going to explain how they are calculated. <laughs> um, so if you, uh, they were one way of splitting up the root privilege. I guess that's the uh, that's the idea. And we, I have all the LSM people here. You can yell at me right away. Yes. 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 We'll yell at you. Okay. <laughs> Damn it. Um, so to split up the root privilege, I mean, root was able to do. Um, is technically able to do uh, anything it wants to. I mean, we recently had the uh, lockdown patch sets and so on. So even that kind of is not necessarily true anymore. Um, but if you Often you might want to delegate specific privileges to unprivileged users. And uh, the big hammer is obviously to give them root temporarily, like sudo is the. You got it backwards. Okay. Interesting. So. Okay, so, so even two, two sides to some extent. So yeah, okay. So uh, Casey's point was uh, it was more about the original motivation was so that privileged programs could drop all of the unnecessary privilege and only retain the privilege that they needed to perform a certain operation. So that, for example, I guess when you had, when you had a binary that needed to do something critical and it got corrupted or there was a bug, you couldn't crash the system, for example. But the other, also the other way is that you can you can also use it to delegate privileges to uh, to unprivileged users, if needed. Um, earlier, this was usually done by set UID binaries and they're insecure and so on. Um, so we have a bunch of them. Uh, the biggest one is Capsys admin. I guess the, the, the <laughs> Michael, is, should I give you the microphone? 
<laughs> so 45% of, uh, of all capable calls are sysadmin? Yeah. So capsys admin is the, well, the joke is it's the new root. Um, so splitting it up has partially worked, uh, not completely. Um, but you have privileges such as uh, cap make not, I think, which uh, lets you restrict. If you drop it, you cannot create device nodes, uh, cap set UID, um, and a bunch of others, cap syslog. Mm -hmm. You know that one? Yeah, I'm playing with that one right now, yeah. Um, so that you can read the message output um, and a bunch of other stuff. They come in one, two, three, four, five different sets. Effective, inherited, permitted, ambient, bounding. Let it be known that for all, you care only actually care about effective right now because that's what the kernel uses to check whether or not you can perform an operation. And permitted is regulating which capabilities you can gain, but it also interacts with the bounding capability set. And then inherited is how you, in, I guess, uh, inherit capabilities that's across, across XFDE, exactly, yeah. but that doesn't work correctly. So you have ambient capabilities which are a way to get around that. And there is like, I've, I'm not joking, I almost cursed, but I won't. Um, if you do man capabilities and you look at how capabilities are calculated, you will see set theory. Like, you know, the intersection of joined with, it's fun. So uh, it's a rather complicated. And then you also have file capabilities, which as I said, are an alternative to uh, setting the set UID bit. So for example, you can say, um, you can set the cape magnot file capability on a given binary, and if you execute that binary, that process will gain the cape cap magnot uh, capability and then can create device nodes. Um, the interesting part about capabilities is that, um, as with most privileges, they originally were only charged against the initial user namespace. So asking, for example, do I have the capability to create device nodes or to mount something was a question like, um, yeah, was a question in general on the system, do I have the capability to do this? But with the introduction of user namespaces, capabilities are now charged for the most part against user namespaces. So capabilities have an owning user namespace. So instead of asking, do I have this capability, you're now asking, do I have this capability in the user namespace that I'm currently in? So for example, I can ask the question for the initial user namespace, can I create device nodes? Do I have this capability? The answer is no. If I unshare a new user namespace because it starts out with a full set of capabilities, the answer will be yes, you can. Um, the problem is, and here is, gets even a little bit, yeah, it, it gets kind of nasty, is uh, a lot of capabilities still ask the question, so for a lot of capabilities, Cape make not, make not included, you still need to ask the question, do I have this capability in the initial user namespace, not in the current user namespace, because otherwise you could attack the host again. All right, yeah, and I'm gonna try and show you a bit, tiny bit of that. Uh, just showing that one, and there. Uh, oops, and this one, there we go. Um, so you can use CapSH to get, to figure out like what your current capabilities are. Um, uh, I should actually get out of that, sorry. Um, so as an unprivileged user on my laptop, I should have nothing, which is good, I've got nothing. But as Christian said, um, capabilities are tied to the user namespace, so when you unshare a new user namespace, you're gonna see quite a different result. Which is literally every single capability. They're all tied to that user namespace. You don't have them against the init user namespace, otherwise you would have a very, very big security problem. Um, but they're there. So one thing I can show is right now I'm did I pass N? I did, yeah. So I can create new network devices. It's great, it's there. Now I can do cap sh drop cap net admin. So that's points a subshell. That's got that capability dropped. And you're no longer allowed to do it. And obviously, you didn't create it. Um, I didn't actually try that part, but I'm pretty sure it should work. So now if I, uh, oops, I forgot dash R. So if I create a sub user namespace now, you've got that interesting um, property where you get all the capabilities again, which includes CapNet Admin. <laughs> 
even though I just ran it from the shell that dropped it. There are ways around this, to, to be honest. You need to drop it from the bounding capability set that so even I can't remember. I would but to make, to, things more, to make things slightly more confusing, you notice that my command is still failing. Well, that's because the network namespace is owned by the user namespace in which I dropped that capability. So even though it looks like I've got it, I don't actually have it against the right namespace. Um, so it's so, still blocked. Right, so it's the same way, uh, I should have mentioned this before, and sorry about that, the same way capabilities have an owning user namespace, all of the other namespaces also have an owning user namespace. So when you create different types of namespaces, the order in which you create them matters. So if you, for example, create a new mount namespace, but then unshare a user namespace, the mount namespace was created before the user namespace and so still belongs to the initial mount, the initial user namespace. So if I try to mount something in that namespace, even though I have technically am owner of the current user namespace, I can still not mount anything because the capability is still checked against the initial user namespace which owns that mount namespace. So I need to do unshare user namespace and then unshare mount namespace in which case the new mount namespace is owned by the correct user namespace, and now I can mount. Actually, that's trivial to show, but I don't know if you want to do it, but. Uh, mess with doing them in different order? Oh. Yeah, if you do unshare the mount namespace first, then unshare a user namespace. And then well, I need to, to do a user namespace first because I'm not root, but. <laughs> so I need to do a, so I can do, so you want user namespace because otherwise I can't do a mount namespace. Then now I'll do a mount namespace. Then now I do another user namespace. For example, yeah. Yeah, so now my first my first uh, user names uh, uh, my first user namespace owns this mount namespace, but my new user namespace does not. And it should still work, right? Yeah, it's still gonna work. Because yeah, I'm pretty sure it's still gonna work. Because <laughs> it's still the same user. Uh, oh actually not. Yeah. Yeah, it's correct. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, there is always, it's uh, interesting to get the relationship. So as we were saying, ordering out. matters with those things. Um. Yeah, so when we, for example, I have a diagram later on, I hope we can still make it, uh, yeah, where, you sure. see, uh, where you see how, uh, how, a container pro how a container is actually started. And then you will see a bunch of namespaces are started or are created right when we create a new process. So we fork uh, a new process with an, in a set of new namespaces, but some of those namespaces we can create right at uh, creation time because we need to do preliminary setup steps before we unshare the namespace and lose privileges to do certain operations. And then also the ownership between the namespaces matters, as we said. Linux security modules, well, that, that's one you will probably take. You're way more experienced with SC Linux and App Armor, and also I don't want to get yelled at. <laughs> Well, mostly App Armor, really. Um, yeah, so for, especially if you're on a privileged container, you do need to use the LSMs to try and make things vaguely sane. Um, for unprivileged containers, they're not strictly needed, but they're a good safety net, and they're nice if you can use them inside the container to then um, properly isolate the applications inside the container, which is something we'll, we'll show with App Armor. Um, LSM stacking, we don't need to go into a lot of details because uh, John covered that part. Um, we'd very much like all of that to be mainline and work great. That'd be amazing for us, but it's, it, it's been slow going and there's a lot of complexity. So um, it's something we obviously look at quite closely. Um, right now, uh, the main thing we use on our side is, is Apama, which does support um, like a inside Apama, effectively namespacing um, mechanism which lets us um, load a profile outside, apply it to the container, make it look like inside the container that it's got a clean slate, and then let the container itself load additional profiles, just like if it was running on the host. Um, that's, that'd be great to have for all the LSMs, but that's still a right. way off. And for, for unprivileged containers, um, as Stefan mentioned, it's, um, it's more or less optional. It's an additional safety net. Um, because unprivileged containers, and especially with the user namespace, are considered to be safe by default. So if you can break out of a container that is not LSM confined, which is unprivileged, then it's probably, it would be a CVE, it would be a kernel bug. I mean, yeah, usually if you can escape on an unprivileged container, it also means that you could get root from a normal unprivileged user on your system. So it's usually pretty bad. Um, yeah, but for uh, for a privileged container, so uh, UID zero inside and outside of the container mean the same thing. 
you will have to use LSMs um, if you want to have any kind of safety guarantees. Um, well, I guess that the one exception to that would be if you were to never have anything running as root in the container. If you're running entirely yes. as an privileged user, then it's not quite as bad. Um, but if you're going to have anything running as root inside the privileged container, then LSMs are pretty much a must. Yes. Now for the demo part of this one. Did switch, yeah. OK. Um, so my laptop is running Ubuntu, so we've got App Armor on it. Uh, if I look at my current process, it is not confined, so it's running um, and confined there. We can use a existing uh, loaded profile and switch to that even as a previous user. Um, we obviously can't addi load additional profiles right that way, but we see that that particular terminal is now under that profile and it's being enforced. Uh, to show something slightly more interesting uh, as far as how that stuff works, um, and that's a bit painful to just do from a straight shell, so I'm just going to spawn LXD container. Okay. Now, if we look at that container, we get its, the PID of its in its system. And let's look proc that PID attribute current. Um, and we see that super confusing string. Um, that's because, for, first of all, we like using complex names for our profiles um, in LexD in general because we don't we want it to be possible to run multiple LexD instances on the same system, especially for our testing environment, and not have the profiles ever clash. So the path in, that's used for LexD storage is encoded in the name of all the profiles and namespaces, which makes it quite a bit longer. Uh, so LXD underscore C1 value LXD uh, is a namespace. We also have a LXD underscore C1 value LXD profile, which makes that string just that much more confusing. Um, and we see at the end that the profile that's going to be seen inside the container is going to be unconfined. So we can go look at that as uh, so it's C1. So I get a root shell in the container. If I go look at my, my view, I see unconfined. But you'll also notice that that particular container has a bunch of profiles that are, are, that are currently loaded. Um, it's not really easy to show, I guess, but um, like effectively doing that, now that TCP don't process, uh, actually, I, can, I guess we can check it from there. Uh, if we go look up, actually, just go back in the container. So we get another shell in the container, and we're going to look at that TCP dump process. And it's confined with a profile that was loaded from inside the container. So that's pretty much that's the state of, of things with um, with Apama. Um, we're, we're hoping to get that and more with all of the others, so we can start mix and matching and having a few containers running on a Linux, a few containers running on Apama. Um, that'd be great for us because we obviously build and provide images for things like CentOS, Fedora, et cetera, for, for the container images. And right now, when you run them on the Ubuntu server, they're going to get an Apalmo namespace and not do much with it. Um, if we could set up SLNX in the container, then they would be able to have enforcement, which would be nice. Yeah, and last uh, but not least, I think this is, the, to some extent, the cherry on top. Um, uh, C groups, which are mostly concerned with uh, resource isolation, I guess, or resource restriction. But um, there are some there are some oddballs in there, actually. Oh, C groups. How many people are using C groups? That would be interesting. Oh, okay, quite a few. I and mean, the rest are. They just don't know. Yes, but actively. Uh, for unless, example, unless, for you're, unless you're not using System D, but for anyone who's using System D is using C group. So they like my it or Chrome not. runs in a dedicated C group. Hmm. But um, you're using V1 or V2? Oh, uh, who knows about V1 versus V2? Okay, that's also quite a bunch of people. Um, so resource limitations. So we're talking about stuff like CPU, block IO, and so on. Um, and. Uh, we use it for every container. So even if you, so because even if you're an, an unprivileged container um, and you have, you create a fork bomb, a fork bomb, for example, 
inside of the container. You could still exhaust all, well, pit namespaces give you some control, but you could still create a lot of processes and then possibly prevent, starve the hosts of, of uh, pits, especially if you run in the same pit namespace, which some container runtimes do, which is a bad idea, but um, that's, that's definitely a problem. Um, and, uh, but you have the PITC group, and the PITC group lets you limit how many, if, how many uh, processes you're allowed to create. So uh, you could you move your container into a separate PITC group and then set, on a, set a limit on how much processes it is allowed to create, and if it has exhausted that limit, it will get, uh, I guess, enomem, um, and cannot create any new processes anymore. Uh, the same thing with how many CPUs is it, is it, will it be able to use. The CPU set controller, at least in the legacy, in the V1 hierarchy, uh, would let you restrict how many CPUs you could use. Let's say you had a 10 CPU system and you said, I only want this container to execute on CPU 1 or, or 2 CPUs, then you could move it into a separate C group and then restrict the, uh, the CPUs it is allowed to execute on. Um, so they allow you to restrict resources. Block I.O., the same thing. Um, then there are a bunch of oddballs in, um, in the C group hierarchy. The devices controller, for example, is kind of odd in the sense that it's not necessarily resource restriction, but it's permission, res it's, it's actually more sort of in the direction of restricting permissions. The C group devices controller lets you specify which devices a container can or can't access, sort of the same way as a black or a whitelist. And you have the freezer C group, which lets you freeze a set of processes. So for example, what I tended to do for a long time, even though it didn't work correctly, was when I, when I, started, I started Chrome. And uh, I didn't all of the time wanted to shut down the browser and then have all of the, you know, have to reload my tabs and so on. So what I did instead, I have it in a separate C group and then I sent a signal into the freezer C group and Chrome just got frozen, whole processes. And then later on, when I needed it, I continued it. Um, this is also kind of an odd controller. Um, so you have a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of controllers that don't really fit into the whole uh, uh, resource restriction uh, picture that C groups give you. Um, but we make heavy use of it. The problem is, or, uh, one of the problems is it comes in two different incompatible versions. Um, so it comes in C group v1 and C group v2. Um, so for example, one of the major um, the delegation model, so if you want to delegate processes, uh, if you want to delegate C groups to, uh, to a process, um, then the models on how to do this in V1 and V2 are vastly, uh, vastly different. Um, and I'm sparing you the details right now. Um, and another glaring example is that C group V1 is a complete pseudo file system. So it means you mount the C group file systems, you mount the specific controller, such as the CPU set controller, which restricts on what CPUs you can execute. And uh, the way you set up the CPU set C group that you just created is by writing into a bunch of files. So you always go through the file system. That has race conditions, okay, that's a problem, but it was at least nice and easy to do this. With C group v2, we now have a model where part of the C groups are file system based, such as CPU set and I guess IO and memory, but some of the C, but some of the C groups now are BPF based. So the, f the device, the C group controller is a BPF controller, which means you cannot configure it by going through the file system anymore. So you see this poses a lot of problems if you think about scenarios where um, you have a new system that uses the C group v2 hierarchy by default. Um, so you boot up your system, there is only a, a, the new C group v2 hierarchy, and now you want to run containers that contain, <laughs> now you want to run containers that uh, run systems, um, and especially an init system, in this case systemd usually, that doesn't know about the C group v2 hierarchy or about, not about newer features of the C group v2 hierarchy, and you have a problem, this won't work anymore. Um, because it's, it considers it crucial. So the problem that you have is running uh, distros that only understand C group hierarchy v1 on a host that understands or only uses C group hierarchy v2 um, is a big problem, especially if you consider that a lot of people use containers to run legacy apps uh, in there that they don't want to run on a host anymore, which so. You have an incompatibility uh, right here. It's otherwise a great tool, but we're working on ways to get around this problem. Um, but yeah, resource restrictions. C groups is the tool to go. Yeah, the other thing that's worth mentioning is um, 
C groups are not always particularly nicely integrated in a kernel. So one of the, the things you'll notice is if you set a limit on your CPU set, so just pin to a specific number of cores, um, and then you set some memory limits, you would potentially expect to see that in PROC CPU info or PROC mem info or in tools like free, but you're not. Uh, you're, those files will always show you the, um, the, the global system resources. They will not show you your actual restrictions, um, which then wreaks havoc on applications that go and look at those files to figure out what they can actually use. Um, on the memory side, like Java is known for blowing up quite badly whenever it's got these memory limit applied. Um, it's a problem we've had to, for a long time and that we've worked around on our side by having a fuse file system called uh, LXCFS, which inspects um, your processes, C groups, and builds virtual versions of those files that can be mounted over the real, the real thing. Um, so I'll be showing that too. Um, Okay. Cool. Uh, so C group is there we go. So on a on a Linux system, you can look at the list of C group controllers that are supported on the machine, as well as the number of C groups that have been um, created on the system this by looking at proxy groups. We should mention this is a V1 hierarchy. Yeah. Um, and if you look at uh, Proxelf C group, then you get your path in every one of those C group controllers. Um, in this case, I, we actually see both hierarchies. So all of the individual controllers are V1, but the last one at the end is a uh, V2 hierarchy because most Linux distributions have a hybrid model where the process tracking the system D does is done in an empty V2 hierarchy. So there's no controllers attached to it. There's no resource control going on there. But the, uh, the process tracking itself happens in that hierarchy, whereas V1 is still used for uh, resource control. So any CPU, PID, memory limit you might have in place are all in the V1, uh, under the V1 controllers. Um, and those are traditionally mounted under CFS C group. So you can see um, effectively one directory per controller. And if you go look inside one of those, you see all the individual files that you can write to to apply limits, and so then directories that have been created for, um, for your users. They're all separate. Usually, um, usually they're all separate mount points. So what you, most uh, Linux distributions do is they mount every controller. Uh, so every one, every one of these controllers is uh, usually concerned. Yeah, you see it right here. Uh, NetCLS, huge TLB devices, CPU set memory, PID CPU, and so on. They're all concerned with different kinds of resources or at least let you restrict uh, resources in different ways. Uh, and what most distributions do for the V1 hierarchy is uh, have separate mount points for all of them. So you see, with example, two exceptions, there's co mounting this, going on for CPU stuff and for right network here, stuff. Yeah, so this right here is the type of controller that is currently mounted. But there is no restriction on how you can actually mount them. So, uh, so you could, for example, and some Linux distributions a long, long time ago used to do this set up a single mount point and then co-mount all of the controllers into a single hierarchy, at which point all of the files that are usually just located under freezer will show up alongside devices, CPU set memory, PITs and CPU and so on files uh, under one directory. That model is completely gone with the cgroup v2 hierarchy. With the cgroup v2 hierarchy, you only have a single mount point uh, and then controllers are enabled or disabled by writing to a file specific to that Cgroup v2 mount. So this is really com completely different just in the way they are, uh, they are set up. Yeah, as I was saying, uh, CPU and CPU accounting and network class and network something else are commanded. So like here, if we look at um, CSFS Cgroup CPU, we can see that we have got both CPU dot files and CPU account dot files. So that's what happens if two controllers are commanded. If we were to do the worst case scenario and mount them all together, then you'll have everything in, in one shot. Um, so first we'll just try, so the usual, I want a user namespace, I want root in there, okay. Um, I'm interested in my PID, okay. 
So I'm switching to another terminal. I'm gonna get actual root in this one. Someday, yeah. Um, and we'll create a new C group under the PIDs controller. So let's call that demo. Then we echo the PID of the process uh, I've got running in the in that namespace, and we'll dump that into um, you want to show C group. Your current C group first. Uh, for for that process. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So currently, the PID controller is under some system D generated thing uh, for that process. So now I'm moving it into that C group. So we see it's been moved to slash demo. Um, in that one, I can now check uh, the number of processes. So we see I've got one process running in there. And my process limit is currently max. Now let's say I'm going to be annoying and literally allow a single process for that C group. Well, what do you think is going to happen if I try to run any command in there now? Uh, this happens. <laughs> So yeah, that's not gonna go so well. Uh, even she is gonna give up, I think. Um, but we can go and be nice, so let's bump that to five. Yay. Um, so that's one of the, the controllers and how they work. Um, you, you could do the same thing with any of the other resource controllers. And that's that way, yeah. You could actually unshare the C group namespace and remount it, but. There is also a way with the C group, uh, the C group namespace that lets you restrict. Right now, you still see the full path, right? You you can guess that on the host, I'm located in the C group sysfs, uh, C group uh, pit. What is it? Pit slash uh, demo. Um, and if you, uh, yeah. What's the one for C group? Oh, capital C. Capital okay. C. Yeah. So if I look, I'm in all those C groups right now. Uh, oh, sorry. Apparently, five is not enough. Fine. There, you get 10. You happy? There we go. So I'm still in the exact same C groups. It's just that now that I've unshared a C group namespace, whatever C groups I was in now becomes the root um, as far as what the container sees. So everything's been reset to slash. Note, you still now, Stefan hasn't done this, you still need to remount the actual uh, C group file system because the actual C group file system currently still lets you access all of like the whole hierarchy. Yeah, that's still going to be pretty confusing now. So, right. So if you now do a remount of the C group, uh, PID C group controller, then. Yeah, so that was. Uh, slash O remount. Uh, well, I do new mount on top. Does that work? Oh, I don't think I unshared the mount namespace. Still out. Uh, already mounted. Okay, but now that I've got a mount namespace, I don't care. I can unmount it. So, or not? You think I can remount it? I'm not sure yeah. I can. Really? I think comma remount remount comma. Um, okay. Nope. Because I, I'm not the owner of the original mount. Ah, OK. Anyway, uh, normally we don't really have that problem with containers because we just make sure they don't see any of the C groups in the first place, then they just mount clean copies. Yeah. Um, which is obviously not the case here. Um, so, more C group stuff. We can show the slightly more interesting cases of. Um, so, you remember I've got that um, C1 container we created earlier. Now, I can, right now, let's just see what's going on in there. So if I go there, I look at my memory, I've got, uh, I see all the entirety of the 16 gigs of my laptop, mm -hmm. and we've got four CPUs. Now let's mess with the C groups a bit. Uh, CPU equals two limits, memory equals one gig. And go back in there. And now we've got the limits applied. No. As I'm, so as I mentioned, those files, um, normally, you would see the entirety of the system. The only reason why we're seeing the right thing uh, is because we've mounted like, CFS, and that overmounts all those files with the real thing. Now, if, we weren't, if they weren't here, so if we were to unmount CPU info and mem info, then even though I've got a limit in place, um, I see all of them. So, you so can now the software, now software right. running in that container would get very confused because they'd be like, oh, I can use 16 gigs of RAM, try to allocate 12, and explode. Some programs are really, they will see, for example, uh, you have 32 gigs of RAM. I'm now going to pre-allocate 8 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and then, obviously, if you have restricted it to, for example, only 4 gigabytes, it gets hilarious. Yeah, another thing we can see in those files is we've got um, uptime. That is also covered by, by uh, LexiFS. Like 
That's because otherwise you don't treat, if you were to run uptime, you would see your host uptime, not the container uptime. So here we can see we've got 18 minutes. So it just looks when the init process of the container was first spawned. But if that hadn't been mounted, then we would be seeing six days. Um, people kind of like knowing when the container started. It's useful for monitoring systems and a bunch of other things too. So that's another thing we've had to paper over with like CFS. Yeah, so this is obviously a, like different to virtual machines. I mean. Right, and so this is something I mentioned before. It's just a real small hackish diagram. I suck at drawing anything, and I suck at diagrams, so I'm very sorry. This is the best I can do. Um, it's, the idea is just you have a container manager, and you have the container over there, and what usually happens is that a container manager is responsible for creating a new process. So it spawns the container, but uh, with the clone system call in the Linux kernel, you can also specify the set of namespaces that you want that process to be created in. And what we usually do for unprivileged containers is that we spawn uh, the user namespace, the PIT namespace, the IPC, and the UTS namespace together at the, when the container is set up. But we don't spawn a network namespace, and we don't spawn a C group namespace. And the reason is that if we were to unshare the C group namespace right away and then move the container later on into the correct C group, the view would be totally off. So we need to defer, for example, creating a C group namespace until the point where we have created new C groups for the container, moved the container process into these C groups, and then unshare the C group namespace and then remount it so the view is correct. The same way for network devices, there is an ordering issue between network namespaces and user namespaces. So if you unshare them together and then write an ID mapping, then the ownership of the network devices will be off, at least for some kernels. I don't know if it's fixed in the meantime. So what you need to do is you need to create a user namespace first, write the mapping, and then unshare the network namespaces so the ownership for the network devices is actually correct. Um, so you have a bunch of different steps. You, the container manager needs to do some stuff, for example, create C groups and write the limits because it's usually the process that is more privileged than the container that is created. So the container can't do the C group, if, can't uh, itself move it into C groups if it's not uh, privileged enough given that it unshared a user namespace. It also sometimes has to do some networking setup depending on whether or not it just requires privileges or not, and it might preserve the namespaces so that it can easily attach to the container and so on. That all needs to be done, and it all needs to be synchronized uh, with what the container process setup, uh, uh, container process setup process is doing which, for example, writes ID mappings right after it created the user namespace, meaning um, it, makes it, it basically becomes root in its new user namespace that it created. Then it unshares the cgroup namespace. After the cgroups have been created, it creates the network namespaces. After the network names, name, uh, devices have been set up, and then does also does the seccom because the process can only do it itself, and then also does its own, uh, writes this LSM, pro wait. Yeah, why writes its own LSM profile. And the way we usually do this is by providing barriers to synchronize. Barriers is a fancy way of saying, for example, you can do this via sockets and send messages that indicate when the container manager is done and tells the container process to go on. And then finally, the container process, until it, when it finished setting up itself, it exacts the init binary. For our case, we usually just boot systemd, and then you have a done container, and the container manager continues to supervise this for the whole life cycle. Usually, you, for example, poll on, uh, you poll on the container, and then you reap it and get the exit signal and so on. One of the essential, um, I guess one of the crucial design steps is when you design a container runtime, which is you would think is a given, but <clears throat> not necessarily is when you destroy the container manager, you not, there are two scenarios, right? Sometimes you don't want the containers to survive when the container manager exits. It's usually not the common case. So for example, we, let's say we have a long running daemon and the daemon, daemon supervises a bunch of containers at the same time, uh, LexD, and then it, it has a bug and the daemon crashes. The last thing that you necessarily want is that all of your containers now go down together with the daemon. So usually what happens is the containers keep on going and then you can just restart the daemon. That is, I think that's one of the main design principles. Yeah, for that we do, we've got a, actually an intermediate 
uh, one per container monitoring process that is gonna singleton, yeah. that's gonna live with the entire lifetime of the container. If that one process dies, it's gonna take the container along with it. Um, even that, but even that process is reasonably simple. It has like a effectively a Unix socket type API that we can talk to to figure out what's going on and get some of the FDs and stuff we need to be able to attach and mess with the container. Um, but we need to make so we need to make sure that that particular API is backward compatible because you you might be upgrading the tools. You don't want to restart the container, so you need to be pretty careful with those things. Um, but yeah, we want if you've got a um, full container manager that tracks a bunch of containers, you don't want that to be the actual parent of everything. Cause this is problems. this is the current. I, I would say this is usually the standard way of setting up containers. I mean, in a nutshell, system D N spawn does the same thing. It also runs system containers. Uh, Lexi does it this way. Um, Runcy does it a little bit. I think is doing it a little bit differently insofar as I think Alexa has written it like some sort of complex state machine. But this is the easy way of how you would usually how you would usually do it. Um, so you synchronize between two processes. You exec. You supervise the container, and yeah. Yeah. The other thing to mention too, like on top of the uh, the ordering of the namespaces, is also the ordering of the mounts. Because if you right. mount if you mount proc and sys too early, you're not gonna be seeing the right processor hierarchy, or you're gonna see you're gonna have the right processor hierarchy, but you're gonna um, like the permission on proxy net, for example, is gonna be off because you've not. You, you basically mounted it before you entered the network namespace, so it's still tied to the host instead of the, the container. So that's some of the stuff you want to make sure, that, like all the five steps you mount, that they've got the right permission for the resources you expect. If not, you probably misordered something. Right. I think that's mostly it, what we wanted to cover. Um, and so we can do a quick repack. You want to do a couple of points? Uh, well, I, yeah. yeah. So, yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So I, I, right here in this setup st step, so the container manager spawns the process that later on, when it has exec, becomes the actual container. You see that under namespaces, it lists user namespace. The easiest way to say to clarify it, this is a privileged container doesn't do this step. But um, in, a, in more detailed, in a more detailed um, way, you can say a privileged container is any container where UID zero on the host on the actual system and UID zero inside of the container have the exact same meaning. Such that, so if you ask yourself the question, what is if a process with UID zero inside of the container breaks out, and the question is, oh my God, the world is going to end slash my computer is shutting down, that's a privileged container. If you think about, ah, if UID zero inside of my can container is breaking out, then eh, it can't do anything. I don't really, I mean, I still care. I still don't want it to happen, but it's not really a, a big problem because UID zero inside of the container and UID zero outside of the container mean totally different things. That's sort of, that's the crux. That's how, so for example, even with a user namespace, to make this a little more complicated, but I think you're all up to the task. So even when you create a new user namespace, uh, you can specify, f for whatever reason, an identity mapping. Like you can say, um, I want a new user namespace, but I want to map UID 0 to UID 0, I want to map UID 1 to UID 1 and upwards. And then you, you, still, you still have the problem that now UID on the host is the same as UID inside of the container when a breakout happens. So when you get that process to be actually escaped to the host, then it has all the privileges that UID zero would have on the host. Um, so that's why we usually say, as soon as you have a process inside of a container where UID zero and UID zero uh, inside and outside mean the same thing, that's a privileged container. If it doesn't mean the same thing, then you're fine. And the way it doesn't mean the same thing, and that's what we showed before, if you look at any of those containers, like for example, a C1 container, if you do IDU inside of the container, then you see zero right here. If you look at the whole process tree for that container from the outside in the PS uh, aux output, then you see that it's a completely random different ID. So look at any of those containers, C1, and then you see the whole process tree right here. Lexi exec bin bash, you see it. Well, you can see it's been in it and underneath. You see it's going to be yeah. uh, 1 million uh, as the base uh, so UID. And so you see Lexi monitor. 
and then you see the child process, which, which is the actual container slash sbin slash init, and then the whole process tree. And if you look at the leftmost column, you'll see that most of these processes run with uh, UID. What is it? One million, you said? Yeah, one million. One million, higher. one million, one hundred, one million, one hundred, yeah. I, uh, one. So, and inside of the, con the, the container, all of these processes would run either as UID zero or one or one or one hundred, and so. ID zero inside of the container has a totally different meaning yeah. than it has on the host. Yeah. That's what a privilege can So in this case, that's the same process tree as we saw, but from inside the container. And the other thing that we can see from inside the container is we can look at its map, which those maps, they're always a bit confusing to read. But what it means is that UID zero in the container is UID one million outside the container, and that there's up to a billion UIDs and GIDs after that. Um, so if I was to use like a billion and one UID, then the kernel would just tell me that doesn't exist. Um, but yeah, you can configure that, and you can do a lot of things with those with those maps. You can do hole punching, so you you can you could actually say I'm gonna map UID zero and I'm to a million outside, and I'm gonna map uh, UID ten thousand to some other number outside, and nothing else. And if you try to use anything else inside the container, you're gonna have a bad time because that those UIDs in GIDs will just not exist. Um, but you, that also allows you to, for example, like punch a hole through for your own UID. Like if you want your UID uh, 1000 outside the container to be UID 1000 in the container, you can do that. Yeah, you'll end up with like three maps, one for the first um, 999 and then the hole and then after that. While we're talking details, there's obviously also the case the, who has paid close attention will now realize, hmm, so what about a scenario where I have a bunch of unprivileged containers running? Great, so I have the host, the host is protected, right? But I worry about the scenario where I have two different processes that I really don't want to interact with each other and I'm afraid that one of the processes might, for, in whatever complicated way, escape into another container. And if they have the same mapping, now you have a problem that obviously the, the containers, even though they're unprivileged, they can attack each other, which you might care about if you have, for example, if you have multiple tenants that all run unprivileged containers. The way to obviously solve this is by giving each container individual ID maps. So I, we call it isolated ID maps. So we, there is an option. This is also, con this is container runtime specific, but it's not magic. You can implement it. Well, we can implement it. Um, so you start a container, you start a second container, and then um, the container manager will take care that all of these containers have individual ID mappings that don't overlap. So if a process from one container escapes into another container, it will be an unprivileged user the same way as it will when it uh, escapes to the host. Uh, there are problems with this, obviously. So the, we, as a container manager, you only know about your own isolated ID mappings, meaning if some other container manager or some other process reuses ID mappings um, that one of your container users or has an overlap, then you still have an, have an attack vector because there is no, co well, there is no nice way to coordinate, to coordinating reserving ID mappings uh, on a system. There may be a way in the future to do this in kernel. Yeah, we might have a way to not have to care in user space, which would be nice. Uh -huh. But that requires a lot of, that will require a lot of thinking, but that would be a nice security feature. Yeah. Um, and it's also for us, for example, it's possible because each container gets a separate root file system. Um, and each root file system can, the IDs and GIDs obviously uh, for all of the files on the file systems get choned to the mapping for the specific container. But now think about a runtime where you, what a lot of users care about, uh, where you have a layered approach, right? So multiple containers share the same file system layer. Now you run into the problem where you, if you want to have, if all of those containers are to have separate non-overlapping mappings, they can't share layers because they can't write to the underlying file system. The way to get around this is obviously to write a file system that <laughs> fakes the ID, the ID mappings on the fly, uh, which is something that we've done, but this is currently just an Ubuntu-specific patch set. We are working on upstreaming it, believe me. We just needed something because we've waited for a long time for this. Um, but the upstream solution will look very different, likely, from what we originally implemented as a, as a, as a POC, as a proof of concept. But if, if you then have a file system that translates, uh, translates uh, the IDs on the fly, then you don't have this, then you don't have this problem. So there's a lot of things to, to actually think about.
Yeah, so um, as he was talking, I was just actually deploying those containers. So we've got, um, I've got five containers now that are running. Uh, the first two, so if you look at the, at the bottom and you look at the first column, the first two are C1, C2, which are, were the ones we created earlier. They're both uh, using a million as the base, um, the base UID, so the root UID. Then I've created two more using the isolated feature, and we see that they're using community distinct um, UIDs as root, and they don't have any overlap in their map. Um, and lastly, the last one I created was using uh, privilege, so we see that that one is actually running as real root. Right. Let's go back to I know the username space is probably, uh, especially if you haven't worked a lot with this, it's probably very conf confusing. It's a very complicated but powerful tool. So um, as a quick way to recap before we take a few questions. Um, so containers are effectively a user space fiction. Uh, there's no such thing as containers in a kernel. Um, it's kind of piecemeal in that you can you take whatever components you want, put together, and then you might call that a container, but then someone else might not agree with you that this is a container or not. Yeah, um, it's not a joke. We said uh, we once attended a conference, a bunch of people who all worked in the, uh, on different runtimes and container workspace, and we argued for one and a half hours, like literally argued what a container is. There is no agreement. And yeah, as the previous slide was showing, uh, building containers can be pretty hard. You need to do it in the right order. There's a lot of complexity around that. Uh, there's a lot of different kernel APIs that have all different concepts that don't always all line up. So you need to be somewhat careful there. Um, also mm -hmm. for SecCamp, uh, actually I did list it there that the, uh, well, it's in my side, the architecture, um, multiple architecture cannot matter. You need to be careful when you generate those policies because if you do have personalities, you need to block both. Um, both at the same time, otherwise there's a pretty easy way to bypass your filter. Um, security definitely matters for containers. I mean, you're, you're sharing the kernel. Um, if you badly configure an, an, a container, if you pass a device, it shouldn't be passing. Um, it's game over pretty quickly. Um, privileged containers are not a good idea. I would not recommend anyone who starts to play with any of that stuff uh, and doesn't use username spaces. We've done a lot of work over the past few years to try and make username spaces work for the vast majority of use cases. And the syscall uh, interception work um, allows for even more because now we can have the container of runtime mediate and fake syscalls as needed to get even more privileges and, um, in some particular cases. Um, resource management is not something that you should just ignore either. I mean, DOS attacks are still attacks, even though they might not be able to escape. I mean, taking your entire host down and all the containers along with it is a bit of a problem. So you want to also set resource limits um, to prevent fork bombs, running out of memory, or even things like using all of your block or disk IO, well, all your disk IOs or network IOs. Um, that's all pretty important to set up right, especially if you're going to be running some amount of interested code in there. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Like, really don't. There are a bunch of libraries and tools out there. There's a pretty good chance that there's a runtime that exists that does what you want and that has already gone through a lot of that mess. Um, so you should be using that. If you can't, then at least use the, the proper libraries uh, from the different components. Uh, LibLXE itself uh, that we use for our system containers does offer um, quite a few pieces that you can use to at least to actually manage all of that in one shot if you want. Uh, but you can also effectively do it yourself. By doing the namespaces yourself, there's no proper library around that. No. But then you've got libraries for C groups like Comp, C Linux, Aparma, all of those uh, capabilities. Um, all of those have their own libraries um, that try and abstract a bunch of um, the common use cases and try to like, have you avoid uh, common mistakes by having the library do the right thing for you. And that's it. Um, if you've got any more questions, uh, I think we've got yeah, about five please. minutes before it's um, dinner time. So. Although, yes. Uh, well, you should probably run with the microphone when you have one of those. That's a good point. Uh, okay, so let's assume that I have a unprivileged container. I have some seccomp rules, for example, not loading kernel modules, even though it's kind of redundant in an unprivileged container. 
Uh, we also have some C groups, you know, the defaults basically. For LXC, I know you have blocked some, uh, some of the system calls that are kind of dangerous. We also block mount and mconod, yeah, basically. Let's further assume that I keep up with uh, new kernel updates, so there are no known uh, bugs in uh, syscalls. How, let's, uh, now let's say that an attacker comes in and get a shell via an application that is running in a container. How can that attacker break out of the container and get into the host? And the second question basically is, if that's sort of not really any theory about how he can get out, uh, is there anything else that the attacker can do to sort of mess with the system? So for an unprivileged container, in theory, there shouldn't be much they can do. I mean, they can wreak havoc in the container, so you need to make sure that you don't, that they can't run you out of resources, because the most, the easiest thing they can do is DOS you. They will try a fork bomb, they will try to fill the entire hard disk, they will try to fill all your network bandwidth, use all the CPU, do those kind of things. Um, escaping, other than having a kernel bug um, that they're aware of that has not been fixed yet. Um, there's not much that should happen there. Uh, the one thing to be careful on top of all of the kernel features is um, your container runtime might be exposing itself to the container in some ways. Um, like if it's passing some kind of socket or some kind of file into the container, that would be a way of attacking the container runtime itself, at which point you'd be root on the host. Um, so that's, that's another common thing to, to keep an eye on. Um, one thing that's also somewhat worth mentioning is that we've, I mean, it's not really an experiment because the terms of service say not to do it, but we have been running a, um, a feature on our website for years now where anyone can just click a button and they get root inside a LexD container that has uh, container nesting enabled. The main idea being that they can play with LexD online without, uh, before first installing it locally to play with it. Um, but it's also effectively a shared environment where we um, hand over root shells to uh, inside an previous container to anyone on the internet. Uh, we've not seen problems with that yet. Uh, we have seen, I mean, the obvious. We pretty regularly have people trying fog bombs. We've got process limits that blocks that. Uh, some people have been trying to fill the file system. Same thing, we've got quotas, that's fine. Uh, we block the CPU and memory quite strictly. That's, that works fine, too. Uh, networking is obvious, obviously an issue, too. So we only allow access to the few servers that we trust. Uh, we don't want to have people mine Bitcoin or whatever in there. Um, or you know, try to attack our network. So, but other than that, any like in general, if for a well-designed, well-configured, unprivileged container, there shouldn't be any way of escaping that. And if there is, it's a critical security issue in the Linux kernel that might also let a unprivileged user, even outside of a container, escalate to root. Um, so those are usually treated as such. So that that obviously does mean that you need to be looking pretty closely at kernel updates. Um, if your distribution supports live patching, that tends to be pretty useful. Um, or otherwise, we usually have pretty much a policy that you know, as soon as a kernel lands, the host reboots whether the containers like it or not, because I mean, for, for a, you uh, want to be patched, to be especially fair, for untrusted workloads. To be fair, for a long time, people have been going on about, uh, f f f rightly so, I think, um, that you know that you have virtual machines and then you have containers and if you can really 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 care about security issues virtual machine but thanks to Jan we now can say Spectre um, which uh, you know is, is kind of the attack surfaces I think are different still to some extent but you know containers have become way more safer over time the problem is usually really just that um, Running privileged containers is still the standard because it's easier, right? I mean, unprivileged containers have the problem that yes, they they come with restrictions, and we usually we we expand it more and more to when as we grow in in confidence that certain kernel features and certain things are safe to do, we expand the ability of user namespaces and or find feasible workarounds such that not just the kernel is in charge of deciding when an operation is, is safe. For example, in the make not case with the second notifier, but we can also uh, uh, delegate the decision to the container manager, which often has more context than, uh, than, the, than the kernel itself. Um, but there are definitely still limitations. 
Um, and so running any kind of workload in an unprivileged container is not necessarily without at least some configuration effort um, easy to be done, but the effort is worth it because if the recent years have shown one thing is that privileged containers cause a lot of CVEs. And a lot of these CVEs, and this is something I mentioned, I think we mentioned in the San Diego talk before, is a lot of those CVEs would simply not possible if you use unprivileged containers. Um, there's obviously an aspect of that the initial tooling for when container runtimes were written was focused on privileged containers, so there is precedence as people are acquainted with a certain set of tools and they don't want to move away from these tools, so you have workflows established in your company and so on, and migrating to a more secure solution comes with costs that you're not necessarily, or it's just, it's easier this way, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's problematic. Um, and I think that's also part of the reputation for a long time that containers were considered less safe. Yes, they, were, they are less safe if you don't use them the right way, if you don't use the security features that they give to you, for sure. I mean, the, the question that I think people need to ask themselves is, for the use case I have, is it really licensed and necessary that I use a privileged container? or is it just that it makes life easier right now? So it's the security versus, you know, easy setup kind of question that you need to ask yourself. And it's not a performance thing, right? I mean, user namespaces don't really come with a performance hit. Even if you nest them a lot, I've, I've done the work to be able to, uh, uh, or uh, if you set up like a lot of complicated mappings, you can specify all kinds of crazy mappings inside of user namespaces. If you, even if you do this and you have like crazy amounts of mappings that you have specified, and if you do the actual performance comparison, it's like it's not really relevant. So performance is not even an issue. So if you're worried, user namespaces might come with performance costs. Nah, not really. Okay. Uh, we're out of time um, because it's bit after six already, uh, we'll be around. So if you've got more questions, just come to the front. We'll, we'll answer those. Thank you.